Father God, we love you. You are always welcome in this place. This is your home. There's nothing without you. If you're not here, Father, we don't want to be. And um, I pray, Father, everybody gets a tangible experience of your Holy Spirit today. You go home filled with the Spirit. So we go out and we go to war all week. We go to war against the enemy, seeking and saving. That's what we're here to do. We're here to get loaded up, to get out there and seek and save. We've got books to give away here. Please give them away. Save us all. Somebody needs to read, Don't Die in Your Sins. There's somebody you're going to run into this week. Please take a book or however many you need. Father, help us. Help us seek and save. It's our calling. It's the Great Commission. We love you. We love the Word. We're all about the Word, being immersed in the Word. And Father, I pray you bless us today with your spirit and your truth. We pray all in the name of the King, B'Shem Yeshua Meshachinu. Amen and amen. Good morning and Shabbat Shalom. Um, dangerous giving me too much time. <laughs> when he has come to occupy the throne of his kingdom, he is to write a copy of this Torah for himself in a scroll from the one the Kohanim and the Levim use. It is to remain with him. He is to read it every day, as long as he lives. So that he'll learn to fear Adonai, his God, and keep all the words of this Torah and the laws and obey him. So that he'll not think he is better than his kinsmen. So that he'll not return. He'll not turn aside, either to the right or to the left, from the midst of the commandments. In this way, he will prolong his reign and that of his children in Israel. Amen? <laughs> kind of got in, in, into Deuteronomy um, this week, and we'll, we'll be there because it's kind of the tour portion next week as well. But I'm going to attack this from a different angle then. But I saw this for you, and um, I hope you get something out of it. When we read the Word of God, its purpose is to learn to fear Him. Is that fair? Keep those words and obey them. The more we read, the more respect we should we should have, right? Not, not be afraid. You can't be afraid of a God you need to trust. You'll never get close to somebody if you're afraid of them. He speaks of respect, reverence. We read the word, the Torah, laws, rulings, commandments. We've been going over this lately. Yeshua never changed that, right? That was what last week was all about. Paul never changed it. Peter, James, John, none of them changed that. Any, and, and, and context has to be important. It's the most important. Thi this is when a king comes to power, right? And, he, and as long as he lives, he's to learn to fear Adonai. Keep his word. Not think about himself being better than his kinsmen. That, that's an issue with kings, isn't it? They think themselves better. Some, sometimes those in leadership do too. When they certainly shouldn't. The reality, if anything, they, they should feel worse because under God they have more responsibility and more to answer for. So there's a weight to that. It says he shouldn't turn to the right or to the left from the commandments. In this way, he'll prolong his reign. So if you read the book of Kings, some of the kings didn't last too long, did they? Not None of them in Israel lasted long. Only a few in Judah, Hezekiah, Jehoshaphat, Josiah, Joash. But other than that, If he does, he'll prolong his reign and that of his children, his children, the people. He has to have a heart for the people. You can't forget the people. David, even in his old age, was like, get me a horse. I'm going out on the front line. I'm going I'm to defend my people. Old, old man. People love a leader, one who leads from the front. Talk's cheap, isn't it? 
Action, action, action. Courage, conviction, dedication. It's contagious, that's why. Now, a little bit of context. I'm just going to wind you back a little bit. That They're entering the land now. Genesis, God creates. And then he calls out Abraham. Through him, the covenant and the promised land promise. Then we get the exodus, the Passover, the deliverance. He shows them how mighty he is. He's forming them into worshippers, right? So they'd have faith. Now a redeemed and delivered people. They start walking through the wilderness of life. And he gives them laws to live by as redeemed people. I showed you last week the law was never flushed down the toilet. We, we, we need law, right? People still get a spiritual, oh, he's mentioned the law. Oh, it's the law. Don't, don't get a spiritual tilt. It gives us the basic tenets of society. If, if we ran society the way the Bible tells us to, we'd have a, a, a lot nicer planet. If we don't have law, there's anarchy, unlawful society, lawlessness, chaos, right? So the laws of God are meant for good. They're meant to give you peace, security, protection, prosperity. The good, the holy, the right, and the just. He loves us, don't he? Why, why would he do anything to us that would hurt us? He wants to protect you. So now they're, wa they're walking through the wilderness and Numbers 14 comes along and, and, and they go into the land and then, and then the 12 boys come back with a bad report. And they've already tested Adonai 10 times already at this point. They go into the land, they get nervous and God says, whoa, whoa, whoa hang on a minute. You're going to be scattered now. You're not going in. You're not ready. And they stay in the wilderness for a while, right? You don't deserve to go into the land. You didn't trust I don't know your God. So now at this point, they're on the cusp of going in. And Moses is going over the history a bit, the vows and the ways of God. So that when they do go in, they're going to be protected. When you've entered the land, I don't know your God is giving you, having taken possession of it and you're living there, you might say, I, I want a king over me. Like all the other nations around us. In that event, you must appoint a king, one whom Adonai your God will choose. He must be one of your kinsmen. This king you appoint over you, you, you you're forbidden to appoint a foreigner. So this is somewhere around 1250 BC. That he's, he's promised this some 700 years before. And he says, you, s you say, I want a king over me, like, like all the other nations. In that event, you've got to appoint the one Adonai says. God's going to choose. You, you need somebody who's got a connection to God. You can't be a foreigner, right? And then he says, he, he's not to acquire many horses for himself or have people return to Egypt to obtain more. In as much as I don't know, I told you never to go back that way again. Likewise, he's not to acquire many wives for himself. So his heart will not turn away. He is not to acquire excessive quantities of silver and gold. Got to be a kingsman. And he's not to acquire too many horses for himself. That, that flies in the face of the um, word of faith movement, doesn't it? The prosperity gospel. Because that's what it teaches. Bigger, better, faster, more, right? He's not to let people return to Egypt. The ways of the world. Understand it's God who will bless you with material wealth. Let him do it. Don't go chasing it. You're going to have to go back to Egypt to obtain it. And he says, don't go back that way. 
don't do that. Paul tells you the same. I told you last week, one, one thing I do know, don't, don't look what's behind. Stop looking back. You've got to press on. Look forward and press on. Stay in the now, but press on. The king said, who, who puts the hand to the plow and keeps looking back? Why? Because if you're like that, you're going to go all over the place, aren't you? It doesn't end well. What, what about Mrs. Lot? Woulda, coulda, shoulda, right? Woulda, coulda, shoulda. The past that held regret over your head is gone. Those chains are ashes now that once were rusted on. Sound familiar? It's history and it's gone. You can't change it, so stop trying to live in it. Live in the now, not in the future, and stop living in the past. The moment now, that's all we have. That's all we have. And it's all to do with the will of the Father. That's how Yeshua rolled, right? Likewise, he's not to acquire too many wives. I, I've got to be honest, I've got my hand full with one. <laughs> well, well, I'm going to pay for that one after. But why? Because you've got to concentrate on, on, on your wife. She's supposed to be close to your heart and under your arm. Yeah. One wife. You can't, like, uh, Solomon had a thousand. A thousand. Yeah. And he was wise? <laughs> Don't acquire excessive quantities of silver and gold. That, that, that wasn't a blanket statement for everybody. Be, be careful, though. Thinking all or nothing and taking things out of context. Don't take it out of context. Just let God be God in your life. All right? Walk in his ways. That's where you find him. When he's come to occupy the throne, his kingdom is to write a copy of the Torah for himself. This is the Lord telling Moses to tell them, copy it from one of the Kohanim. The one the Kohanim and the Levites use. Like, don't make your own up, King Jimmy. There's a difference between Kohanim and Levite as well. Did you know? I bet you don't know this then. Smarty pants. <laughs> the name Levi is often associated with meaning joined or attached. It goes back to Genesis 29:34, where Levi's mother, Leah, she said, now my husband will become more attached to me because I've born him three sons. And so she named him Levi, reflecting a hope in Jacob that he'd be closer to her because of Levi's birth. His descendants became set apart. Special religious duties being joined to the service in the tabernacle and the temple, assisting the Kohanim, the descendants of Aharon, no, known for light-bearing. So what that means, Kohanim, it's got a connotation there, light-bearing. Why? Because they're responsible for the spiritual well-being of the, the people. Teaching the Torah, performing the various rituals, they perform the priestly bless blessing, it's channeling divine light and the Lord's blessings to the congregation. And they were responsible for lighting the menorahs. Literal and symbolic act of bringing light into the sacred place. Both priesthoods, servants of the Lord. Ain't that beautiful? Do I get a bonus point? Okay. The king was to read the Torah every day. Some, some don't go near the Bible for weeks. Oh, but you're close to God, right? Really? He's to read it every day as long as he lives. 
then he'll fear Adonai. Keep all his words, his laws, obey them. In this way, he's going to prolong his reign. That of his children. So you can read that. And that part, part of what we, we've been brought up to do in Beth Yeshua um, is to join the old to the new. The new obviously being the old revealed and the, and, and the new... The old revealed. What did I just say? I just said that wrong, didn't I? The old revealed and the new concealed. Yeah, yeah. Concealed with whatever. <laughs> I've not had enough coffee yet. <laughs> it, but there's a lot of truth to it, isn't there? The idea, though, is that we see Yeshua in the scripture. And in Deuteronomy 17, 18, 19, and 20, it you're going to see it in its context, it's probably the most important revelation of Messiah in Deuteronomy. Hopefully, the next few scriptures you're going to see Yeshua as a prophet, as a priest, and most importantly, as a king. How does that one sound? Adonai will raise up for you a prophet like me from among yourselves. From your own kinsmen, you are to pay attention to him, just as you were assembled at Horev. Horev is another word for Sinai. And requested Adonai God, don't, don't let me hear the voice of Adonai anymore. Or let me see this great fire ever again. If I do, I'll die. On that occasion, Adonai said to me, they're right in what they are saying. I will raise up a prophet for him, like you, among the kinsmen. I'll put my words in his mouth and he'll tell him everything I order him. Whoever doesn't listen to my words, which he will speak in my name, will have to account for himself to me. But if a prophet presumptuously speaks a word in my name, which I order him to say, I didn't order him to say, or if he speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet must die. Strong, right? So Moses speaking to the people, he's telling Adonai is going to raise up a prophet, just like me, from our own. That that's a messianic prophecy right there, right? One of one of three hundred and thirty three in the Old Testament. He has to fulfil all of them. And he did. Now, I might wreck your head for a minute with this. Th these laws of compound probability. And the compound probability of one man in history fulfilling 333 prophecies is astronomical. Astronomical, but God. Pasadena Uni did a compound probability study on just eight of those, those um, prophecies. Eight, just eight. Oh, choose, choose any eight you like, where, where he'll be born, how he'll die, whatever. Doesn't matter, just eight. That one man in history would fulfill, just eight. And the compound probability came back as a hundred quadrillion to one. That's one in ten to the seventeenth power. One with seventeen zeros behind it, that's quite a big number. That's just eight. Let, let me give you some perspective. If you take Tasmania and you fill Tasmania a meter high with dollar coins right across it, full, meter high thick, meter thick, dollar coins. You get in a plane and choose wisely because you're going to parachute out of that plane and when you land you've got to pick one coin the one coin that's got a red dot on it not easy eh? that'd be a hundred quadrillion to one of a chance do you get it you feel it 
That's compound probability. Shane Dead's going tick, 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 because he's a mathematician. I can hear it now. <laughs> but God, because Yeshua fulfilled 333 of them. Why? He's the Messiah. That's why. So a prophet like me, he says, one of your own kinsmen, meaning he's going to be Jewish. You've got to pay attention to him, just as you were assembled at Sinai when you got the Ten Commandments. But you requested of Adonai, don't, don't let me hear that again. In other words, they need a mediator. And they're right in what they're saying. I will raise up a prophet like you from among the kinsmen. I will put my words in his mouth. He will be a real deal prophet. Pe people say they have prophecy. Oh, I've got a word. I have to tell you how many times I've heard that one. I've got a word for you, Rani. I thank God he's merciful. Because be careful with Adonai says. Eh? Because if Adonai is not said, you're taking his name in vain. He doesn't like that. It's quite, it's quite a biggie, really. Don't take my name in vain. Adonai says when Adonai hasn't said. I'm going to put my words in his mouth. He, he, he's going to tell you everything I order him. So the reason we use a lot of scriptures is because we're, we're safe with God's word. And you can trust it. It's not Arnie's opinion then. Whoever doesn't listen to my words, which he will speak in my name, you, you're going to have to give an account. Prophets back then, they, they didn't do it for the glory, for the money. They weren't prophets with an F. Amos, you remember Amos? He, he got one prophecy, he, he went and gave it and went back farming. And they're like, well, well, what? Well, it's got to be more than that. I've, I've told you what I've been told. I'm going. And he, he took off. No hoopla. Done. Message given. And he bailed. But it gets serious, doesn't it? If a prophet speaks presumptuously in my name or in, the, or in the name of another God, that prophet must die. Who wants to be a prophet then? Now, I did miss this one on the Brian. Is it there? Next one. John. I've not got it on there. There you go. John's testimony. They've heard about this crazy nutbag. He's baptizing people out in the wilderness. So they send the boys out, the Kohanim, the Levites from Jerusalem. They, they, they've heard all about him. He's wearing camel hair clothes and he eats locusts. He's a bit weird. But it, he's affecting people. And it's rocking them a bit and they, and they don't like it. Send the big... Who, who are, you? are you? Are you the Messiah? And John's straightforward. He, he, and you need to be. You don't sugarcoat. The, the, he, he, he'll never end well if we sugarcoat things. People need the bread. They need the bread of life. They need the truth. Far more nutritional. They're wondering if he's the Messiah. But he's up front. He's saying, I'm, no, I'm not the Messiah. But they're looking and they're thinking, but it could be. Right, could be. He's zealous. The people are flocking to him. And they rattled. Like, well, who are you then? Are you Elijah? Are you the prophet? Not a prophet. The prophet. Why? Why? Because they knew the Torah. Are you the one we're expecting? We're eagerly expecting the prophesied Messiah in the Tanakh. The Tanakh, the Torah, the Navim, the Keturim. 
the Old Testament, the Pentateuch, the writings, the prophets, the 333 prophetic writings that there is. They knew them. Don't make any bones about it. They knew them. They didn't have a New Testament, did they? You didn't need it. You don't need it to find Messiah. What did Yeshua use on the Emmaus Road? He's talking to his disciples and he's shown himself in the scriptures. What? First Corinthians? Romans? How? Gospels? Nope. He only had the Old Testament to go at, didn't he? And he showed them who he was. Bing, 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 bing. Faith exploded. And Yeshua fulfills those prophecies. They say, the prophet. Now, you, you could read and know Deuteronomy 18.15. You, you might know very well, but you could wash over that, couldn't you? The prophet. It's important now. They're waiting for the prophet. When people saw the miracle, he performed, they started saying it. This has to be the prophet who's supposed to come into the world. John 14, John 6, 14. On hearing his words, some of the people in the crowd, surely this man is the prophet. This is the Messiah. How can the Messiah come from the Galil? Doesn't the Tanakh says that Messiah is from the seed of David? He comes from Beit Lechem, the house of bread? The village of David? How little did they know? The boys in the boys in the in the Sanhedrin were like, "There's no prophets from the Galil." Uh, yeah, there was. Jonah was from the Galil. Read your Bible. Surely he's the prophet. Yeshua then had to occupy the office of being. The prophet. Who's the prophet? He's the one who speaks as God, not for him. He has to hold the office of priest. Deuteronomy 17, 8 to 9. If a case comes before you at the city gate, which is too difficult for you to judge concerning bloodshed, civil suit, personal injury, or any other controversial issue, you to get up, go to the place, I don't know, your God will choose, and appear before the Kohanim, or the Levine. And the judge in the office, uh, they'll judge at the office at the time. Seek their opinion. They'll render the verdict. Wouldn't it just be peachy to have an uncorrupted legal system and a judiciary where justice is blind? Wouldn't that just be nice? Everybody equal under the law. Wouldn't that be nice? No deals, no plea bargains, no paying off. Well, you can't be put in prison for a social media post. <laughs> but you rape somebody and you get community service. That kind of deal. That's happening in Britain right now. Where's the justice gone? And they say we should separate church from state. Really? Really? Can you imagine legitimate priests in the court? Levites who will judge in office. Seek their opinion. They'll render the verdict. The priestly office Yeshua had to fill is to be a priest judge, a priest teacher, and a priest warrior. I'll show you. A branch will emerge from the trunk of Yeshai, Jesse. A shoot will grow from his roots. The spirit of Adonai will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom, understanding, the spirit of counsel and power, the spirit of knowledge and fear in Adonai. He'll be inspired by fearing Adonai. He will not judge by what his eyes see or decide by what his ears hear. He'll judge the impoverished justly. He'll decide fairly for the humble of the land. And he'll strike the land with a rod from his mouth and slay the wicked with the breath of his lips. Context, who's that about? Mashiach, right? Mashiach. A branch, a shoot going to emerge from Jesse. Shoot town. Nazareth. He'll be inspired by fearing Adonai. Respect for the Father. 
and she withdraws his inspiration from the Father. We, 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 we think he went to the cross because he loves us, and he did, but his primary driving force was his Father and obedience to him. He was doing it out of the love for the Father. And in him we have the greatest model of sonship. He's our example, he's our inspiration. And that inspiration comes from the Father as well. And if you love the Father, you'll love people. Because we love Yeshua. That it just all trickle down spirituality, isn't it? He will not judge by what his eyes see or by what he hears. It's about discerning. It's about walking out the truth. Yeshua is the truth. He knows the truth and he is the truth. And that's where we make our stand. Whatever comes at us, we stand on the truth. He'll judge the impoverished justly. Power and money seems to get the verdict these days. Big shot lawyers. The best legal defense costs you a lot of money. Don't, don't you think they all play golf together? <laughs> the judges and the lawyers? Where, where do you think they where do you think they socialise? The nineteenth hole. Hey, can you help me out with this one? It's all about the money. But thirty percent gets your majority of government these days. How does that work? It's not very democratic. But we keep playing the same game, don't we? Red and blue and red and blue and red and blue. And nothing ever changes. How come? That's the definition of insanity, isn't it? Keep doing the same thing, getting the same result. They serve outside global cabals, unelected and unaccountable. And here we are at a point in history when everything seems to be getting very biblical, doesn't it? Everybody's rattled. Everybody's kind of feeling it. You're not going to get a legit government until Yeshua comes back. It's going to be on his shoulders. Justice and righteousness are his foundation. He's fair and he's right. He'll strike the land with a rod from his mouth and slay the wicked with the breath from his lips. That's the king. I can't do a thing on my own. As I hear a judge and my judgment is right because I don't seek my own desire but the desire of the Father. Because that's what Yeshua is all about. Just doing his father's will. Only wants to please daddy. So you see him as a priest judge. Fair? In accordance with the Torah, they teach you. You have to carry out judgment, they render, not turning aside from the right to the left. So much in a small amount of scripture in the Old Testament, right? They teach you. Yeshua has to be a priest, teacher. Mark 6, when Yeshua came ashore, he saw a huge crowd filled with compassion for him because they were like sheep without a shepherd. He began teaching. John 7, not until the festival was half over did Yeshua go up to the temple courts and began to teach. What, se what festival is that? John 7. What? I can't hear you now. Tabernacles, good. What's the feast in chapter 6? Ah, it's Passover. There's a six month gap between 6 and 7. Isn't that, isn't that weird? And then you get other scriptures that go by the minute, you know? Context. Yeah, it's Sukkot. He always taught in the temple courts. He's recognized as a legitimate rabbi. You can't, you can't just walk in a synagogue and pull out a scroll and, and teach. That's not how it rolls. You've got to have a little gravitas about you. Be recognized. Have some authority. He was a legitimate, recognized rabbi.
And then you go to John 3. And here we have a man among the perishim. And David Stern calls him Nachdemon. He's a Pharisee, a separated one. Actually, he's a Pharisee's Pharisee. This is Israel's teacher. And his name's Nachdemon. You, you might know him better by his Greek name, Nicodemus. But he's a Jew born and bred. Why would he be called with a Greek name? He, he's called Nachdemon. A name's better chosen than silver or gold, isn't it? What? When, when Joseph of Arimathea goes to Pilate and says, I want to get him down off the cross. And Pilate says, okay. So it's Joseph who climbs the ladder and gets Yeshua down. Who does he hand him to? Nachdemon. Innocent blood. Nachdemon, the rabbi's rabbi. He taught all the rabbis to then go out and teach in the synagogues. Everybody thinks he's, he's thick as two short planks, don't they? Oh, what do you mean? You've got to be born again. He don't get it. And you're thinking 21st century. You've got no idea what you're talking about. When, when, he, when he became a rabbi in Jewish thinking, now he's born again. When he gets married, he's born again. When he becomes a rabbi's rabbi, He's born again. And he's looking at Yeshua going, you tell me I've got to be born again. What more have I got to do? That's why he didn't understand. Makes a difference now. Many people will go and say, come let's go up to the mountain of Adonai, to the house of the God of Jacob. He's going to teach us his ways. We will walk in his paths. For out of Zion will go forth the Torah. And the word of Adonai from Jerusalem. I'm meant to that. Messianic prophecy yet to be fulfilled. For out of Zion will go forth the Torah because it will be Yeshua teaching it in a very, very physical temple. Very physical temple. Because he's very physically going to come back and land on the Mount of Olives. And the, the Kidron Valley is going to physically explode and flatten out in front of him and go up to a eastern gate that the Turks concreted in to stop him getting in. He'll kick that one through and walk into a temple from which he will rule and reign for a thousand years. That's the gig. That's what he's going to do. He's going to teach us for a thousand years and then, then, then we all go through a really big graduation ceremony and, and we move into the new heavens and the new earth and have a forever Shabbat. So he has to be a priest judge, he has to be a priest teacher and he has to be a priest warrior. When you go out to fight your enemies, you see horses, chariots and a larger force than yours. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid, because I don't know your God, who brought you out from the land of Egypt, is with you. And when you're about to go into battle, the Kohanes to come forward and address the people. He should tell them, listen Israel, you're about to do battle against your enemies. Don't be faint hearted or afraid. Don't be alarmed or frightened. Because I don't know your God is with you, he's going to fight on your behalf. And then he turns around and goes, okay, I'm going back to the temple now, have a good one. No, he didn't. He went out in front of him. But Adonai will fight on our behalf. There they were. At the beach. They're in the Gulf of Aqaba. And they've got a mountain range behind them. And they've got the Red Sea in front of them. And they've got the hardest battle-hardened troops, chariots, the whole shebang, the whole full force of the 
the Egyptian Empire barreling down on them. Literally between the devil and the deep blue sea. And he's reminding them he delivered them from it. You're never going to see them again. It's history to us, but to them it was real because they've been through it. Don't be faint hearted. Don't be afraid. Don't be alarmed or frightened. I don't know. God is going with you and he will fight on your behalf and he will give you victory. And Yeshua said the same thing. He said, I'm always going to be with you. That's all we need to know. That's all we need to know. I'll be with you. And he'll fight on your behalf. And he will give you victory. Amen. Revelation says, I, I, I will let him who wins the victory sit with me on my throne. Just as I myself won the victory. And sat down with my father on his throne. Those who have ears, let them hear what well, the Spirit is saying in the Messianic community. Notice, he says, he won. He won. Past tense. The victory is already won. Here, wh who's he talking to here? Laodicea. Le uh, let me tell you what that means. Laodicea, it, it means people that make their own decisions. Should be guided by justice and fairness in its literal sense it has come to mean and be defined lukewarm so it's actually a word in the dictionary now it's like you're all dicing lukewarm or indifferent why because Yeshua saw that they were neither committed nor completely disengaged they were to all intents and purposes, lukewarm. And it's been come to understand as anyone who lacks wholehearted dedication to the faith, that, that would make you lukewarm, will have some faith and act like a winner because we've already won. The victory's already won. Next I saw the heaven open and there before me a white horse Sitting on it was the one called Faithful and True. And it's in his righteousness that he passes judgment and goes to battle. His eyes like a fiery flame. And on his head were many royal crowns. He had a name written which nobody knew but himself. He was wearing a robe that had been soaked in blood. And the name by which he is called the Word of God. The armies of heaven clothed in fine linen, white and pure, were following on white horses. And out of his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down nations. He will rule them with a staff of iron. And it's he who treads the winepress from which flows the wine of the furious rage of Adonai, God of heaven's armies. And on his robe and on his thigh, he's, he's got a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He's going to come and finish what he started. A white horse now, a war horse. No donkey this time. Not humble donkey. No suffering servant anymore. He's faithful. He is forever faithful and true. It's in his righteousness he passes judgment. He has the right because he is right. Eyes like a fiery flame. That's not good. People go, oh, he's, he's got fiery flame, full of passion for his people. No. No. His head's got many crowns, not thorns anymore. He's got a name that nobody knew except the nutbag on YouTube. <laughs> and I, I'm, I suppose you did, so you know the name. You know the sacred name. Does that make you share the gospel more? How many people have you saved? How many people have you fed this week? Does it make you give more? The blood-soaked robe. He's coming back with a sword in his mouth and fire in his eyes, soaked in blood. It ain't going to be pretty. It's not going to end well for someone. 
People forget this part of him, it, uh, but it's, a, it's so important. It's why we seek and save. The army of heaven, clothed in white, pure, white horses, heaven's armies. Somebody's going to get a kick in. Nations are going to get a kick in. It's a very, very wide road, isn't it? That many find. That's why we, sh we shine and seek and save and share. He's going to tread the wine press. Hebrew idiomatic expression. He's going to crush his enemies. Furious rage. Furious rage. That's your wrath right there. Ra wrath and tribulation are two different things. Two different things. Wrath is orge. That's this. Tribulation flips this. Different words, different meanings. They're never used in the same sentence. They're never used interchangeably. Ever. Tribulation is tribulation. We will have tribulation, but we will not see his wrath. Does that make sense? He's a master of war. Isn't it comforting to know that you're watched over by the master of war when the enemy comes at you? It comforts me. It's what I need. King of kings and lord of lords. So he's a prophet, he's a priest. And we saved the best till last because now we're going to see him as a king. How are we doing? We okay? You've entered the land, I don't know, you God is giving you. I mean, taking possession of it and you're living there, you may say, I want a king over me. Like all the other nations. Understand this, the Torah never commanded Israel to have a king. Now, if you know your Bible, you, you'll know it wasn't Adonai who instilled that. It was the people. And it broke his heart. I'll show you. First Samuel. Adonai said to Shmuel, listen to the people, to everything they say to you. But it's not you they reject him. They reject him, me. They don't want me to be the king over them. They're doing to you exactly what they've done to me from the day I brought them out of Egypt until today by abandoning me and serving other gods. Not good. No, no, we want a king. We want to be like the other nations. But they already had one. We've got a king too. But someone's going to say, no, no, Arnie, I, I don't know, I commanded it. It's in the Torah. It's there. There would be kings. Maybe you're thinking of Genesis 49. Yehuda, your brothers will acknowledge you. Your hand will be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's sons will bow down before you. The scepter will not pass from Judah. The tribe of the kings, right? Nor the ruler's staff from between his legs until he comes to whom obedience belongs. And it's he who, whom the peoples will obey. The scepter will not pass from Judah. This, this is a messianic prophecy prophecy of the king that will come from the tribe of Yehuda, Judah what tribe was Yeshua from yeah Judah Judah he says whom obedience belongs or some versions say until Shiloh comes and you kind of what does that mean until Shiloh comes to Shiloh, the one to whom peace rightfully belongs. That's what Shiloh means, and there can only be one, and it's Mashiach, it's Messiah Yeshua. Right? Could I get an amen for that one, people? Amen. amen. In that event, you must appoint a king, the one whom I don't know your God will choose. You must be one of your kinsmen. So they go, we want a king, we want a king, Samuel 8. And Moses had already told him, in that event, you, you've got to appoint a king, I don't know, he chooses. He must be one of your own. You've got to wait on the Lord, let him choose. What? Why don't we cry out 
on our hands and knees. Why don't we skip an odd meal? We should. Why don't, why don't we do what the Lord wants? Why don't we try and find out what he wants? It's not what we want, it's what he wants. That's the deal, isn't it? What we want is irrelevant. And let God choose. A child is born to us, a son is given. Dominion will rest on his shoulders. He will be given the name Pele Yoetz El Gibor Avi Ad Sa Shalom. The wonder of a counselor, mighty God, father of eternity, and he's the prince of peace. In order to extend the dominion and perpetuate the peace of the throne and the kingdom of David, to secure it and sustain it through justice and righteousness henceforth and forever, the zeal of Adonai Tzavot will accomplish this. So there you see a child is born and a son. That points to two advents child is born a baby in the manger a son the white horse on which government will stand two advents one messiah two advents one messiah dominion will rest on his shoulders full authority wonder of a counselor mighty god father of eternity the prince of peace in order to extend the dominion perpetuate peace the throne of david secure it sustain it through justice and righteousness, henceforth, always and forever. Amen and amen. How will it be accomplished? By the zeal of Adonai, the Lord of hosts. Who's that? He's picking the king. He's picking Messiah, not us. God already picked him. He's already picked him. However, he is not to acquire many horses for himself or to have people return to Egypt to obtain more, inasmuch as Adonai told you never to go back. Don't acquire many wives so that his heart will not turn away and don't acquire excessive... Acquire? Acquire, sorry. Freudian slip. Excessive quantities of silver and gold. This isn't a salvation station. This is teaching for the lost. We go out there and seek and save the lost. This, this is where we get loaded up, right? We go out and preach out there. This is to encourage you. This is to strengthen you. This is to get you filled. So you go out in the power of the Holy Spirit to confound the works of the enemy. That's the game. So many times people bring lost souls and the people that are saved are dying because they're not hearing the word. Dehydrated from the lack of living water and they've not grown in years. It's sick, isn't it? It's sad. It's disgraceful. You've got to go home and do your own Bible studies. Not, not on my watch. He's not going to acquire many horses for himself. Lots of wives of silver or gold. What, why? What, what if he acquires lots of horses and he goes into battle? Who's winning now? Him. Right? Uh, what, what are you saying, Annie? Are you, are you saying God wants us to be weak? Yeah. No. Yeah. Why not too many wives? Hmm? Well, they do. But a king wouldn't marry common folk, would he? He'd marry other king's princesses, therefore having to forge alliances. And if you do that, you're going to end up serving other gods. Just ask Solomon. He fell to all of this. Silver and gold, wealth. What? You, you've got to watch out for the three Gs. That got bounced on me by Rabbi Greg from day dot. Gold, girls and glory. Don't touch them. <laughs> I 
Every minister can fall for one or all. You have to trust in God alone. A leader has to trust in God alone. Done. The branch will emerge from the trunk of Jesse. The shoot will grow from his roots. The spirit of Adonai will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding. Justice will be the belt around his waist. Faithfulness, the sash around his hips. Wisdom, discerning between the holy and the profane. Understanding the knowledge and ability of how to apply it. There's no <coughs> point in understanding something if you can't apply it. Justice and faithfulness, the foundation of his throne. You, you see it all over the Psalms as well. All about Yeshua. He's come to occupy the throne of his kingdom. He's to write a copy of the Torah. Make a scroll for himself. The Torah, we think of it as Genesis to Deuteronomy. I, the, the, the Torah, I think as we've recently discussed, is, is teaching. It's teaching. And we have to hit the mark. The connotation of the root word yara is to hit the mark. Therefore, to sin is to miss the mark. We hit the target when we obey God. The whole of God's word, to me, is Torah. First five books, obviously foundational. I told you last week about Matthew 5.17, Yeshua quite clearly stating he didn't come to abolish the law, the Torah. He did not come to do away with the laws of his father. If he did, they cannot be a chad. We have one God. How do we think of God? One times one times one equals one. one. Boom. That's Hebrew thinking. Even the Christian scholars, I, show, I showed you, they, they, they say we have law because we have to be lawful. I'm not talking about salvation. It's nothing to do with salvation. Grow up. You're saved. How many times do you want to be saved? We're saved, aren't we? Anybody not saved? Because if you're not saved, I can really, really help you. <laughs> We're saved, but we have to grow. And we have to be lawful. How, how can you profess Christianity and say, well, yeah, don't worry about the commandments? Doesn't add up, does it? That, that's what Martin Luther did to the Jewish people. He, 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 he looked at it, he, he figured it out. We're, we're saved by grace, by faith. Sweet. No problem. Woohoo, we're free. He's coming out of Catholicism. But then he goes to the Jewish people and he says, hey, Jews, you can have Jesus too. And they go, okay, how? Well, you just come to Jesus, forget about them commandments, stop doing that Jewish stuff. And they go, sorry, Marty, no can do. And then he decides to persecute them. They've already been persecuted from the, the first century on. Because the enemy just floods the public square with Jews killed Jesus. That's what causes all the trouble. It's caused the trouble from then. It start, the, the third letter of John is there before John passed. They wouldn't let John in a congregation. How did that happen? The one who Yeshua loved the most. You know, you can't come in. Why? He was Jewish. How did that happen? <sighs> it doesn't add up Yeshua didn't nail the commandments he nailed your shortcomings to them he nailed your sin we are called to obedience because we trust we have the faith we have faith in what we love and we do love him because he loved us first and he's our example isn't he He'll not think of himself better than his kinsmen. He won't turn aside either to the right or to the left from the mitzvah. He's going to prolong his own reign and that of his children. What, what did Yeshua do? 
Philippians says this, though he was in the form of God, he didn't regard him regard equality with God something to be possessed by force. On the contrary, he emptied himself. He gave up his divinity in that he took the form of a slave by becoming like human beings. And when he appeared as a human being, he humbled himself still more and became obedient. He became a lamb and even a worm, Psalm 22 says. By being obedient even unto death, death on the stake as a criminal. Very, very selfless and humble. That's his character. It's beautiful, isn't it? And he knew. He knew when to be quiet. He knew when to turn the tables over. When to be a lion. And there are those times. You've just got to know your timing. Luke says he will be great. He will be called son of ha Elion, the most high. Adonai God will give him the throne of his forefather David and he will rule the house of Jacob forever. There will be no end to his kingdom. Endless dominion. So that's the good news. That's, that's what I want you to take away with it from today, if nothing else. But and there's this, there's more. You're sure... You want to see him in the scriptures. I, I see him in the refuge cities. Look at Deuteronomy 19. I don't know your God. Cuts off the nations whose land I don't know your God is giving you. And you take their place and settle in the cities and houses. You are to set aside three cities for yourselves in your land. That I don't know your God is giving you to possess. Divide the territory of your land. Which I don't know your God is having you inherit. Into three parts and prepare the roads so that any killer can flee to these cities. They call cities of refuge. A killer can flee to the cities. Why? What what if you've killed somebody by accident? Their relatives are still gonna get pretty miffed, aren't they? So you can flee to that city and you can have refuge there. They're gonna be after revenge. So you're able to run there until you can get judgment. So they have protection. Yeshua is our city of refuge. If we claim not to have sin, we're deceiving ourselves. The truth isn't in us. If we acknowledge our sins, then since he's trustworthy and just, he'll forgive them and he'll purify us from all wrongdoing. See, see how he's wrote that? You've got, you got to read slow if we claim not to have sin. What's that? Present tense. Not past tense. It doesn't say if we claim not to have had sin, does it? We're deceiving ourselves. Self-deception. A lot of the time the enemy can just kick back and, and just laugh his head off at us because we're just destroying ourselves. so self-deceived we're doing his job for him if we acknowledge our sins though present tense since he's trustworthy and just he's going to forgive him and he's going to purify us from all wrongdoing and want Johnny beautiful he says if we if we claim he's putting his self in with us isn't that beautiful very very humble the closest one to Yeshua Our sin is our corrupt nature. When we're sinning, those are the evil acts that we do. But our sin nature is worse than the sins. We tend to focus on our sins rather than our sin nature. That's the corruption. He knows we are, and he knows what we go through. He knows our heart, and he's merciful thereof. Easy to blame him, though. We, we always blame him, don't we? Well, why, God? Don't we? You, you wouldn't do that if you wanted to keep a friendship on earth, though, with somebody. Would you? You wouldn't treat him like that, would you? 
Don't do it to him. He's incredibly merciful and forgiving. It's a sin nature. If we focus on our sins, not the sin nature, we, we completely underestimate our sin nature and overestimate our goodness and our purity. Yes, justified in faith. We repent, we, we turn, we turn back to God. Teshuva. Break our hearts and we say we're sorry. That, that's judicial forgiveness. Right? Is that fair? For salvation. But we have to continually walk in repentance. And say sorry. Why? Parental forgiveness. Maintain fellowship. We have fellowship with the Father and with each other. We, we, you can lose fellowship though, can't you? When, you? when you tell your kids off, get to your room. Now, now you're out of fellowship, but you're still the mum, aren't you? You're still Isaac's mum when, when you're doing a rollicking. What, what, what's the easy fix though? Sorry, mum. In it. Now you're back in fellowship. Some might not even hear, they might not be connected. You get so busy running and gunning. Taking care of everything. You've got to calm down and come back. Calm down and come back. Get washed clean and get back in the game. Stay in fellowship. My children, I'm writing you these things won't, so you won't sin. But if anyone does, we have Yeshua the Messiah, the Tzadik, who claims our cause with the Father. He's our Kapura for our sins. Not only ours, but also those for the whole world. Notice he says, if you sin, not when. Why? Because you, sh you, sh you shouldn't get out of bed and attack your day with your sin nature thinking well I'm going to sin anyway no. let's get it over sorry God that's a crappy attitude isn't it yeah. well, it's more like no I don't want you to sin yeah. but if you do yeah. we have Yeshua the Messiah the Zadik the righteous one he's our mediator he, he's our covering our kippurah you get kippur, kippur covering Kippurah. He's our covering for sin. He is our Yom Kippur. He pleads our cause with the Father. Don't miss that bit. Sin breaks fellowship, not relationship. Many times your kids will do things you hate, but you're still the mum and dad. But you don't want to be out of fellowship, do you? Don't, and don't be prodigal. Don't be arrogant. Don't, don't be a prodigal. Y you'll pay a heavy price. Not that you'll be out of the kingdom, but it's going to cost you some pain. It's going to cost you some suffering. Price you don't want to pay. But you'll always be with the Father. He'll never leave you. He'll never leave you. Don't let anybody rot your salvation. None of us are perfect and he knows it. So don't beat yourself up. Walk in forgiveness. Forgive yourself. Forgive yourself. A lot of people don't. It causes a lot of stress. Don't let it go. Let it go. Don't engage the enemy. Don't let him bring it back up. He always replays it for you in, in your head, doesn't he? Yeah, Kick him out. It's the grace of God. He forgives you. When you say you're sorry, and that's genuine, it's done. Now, there's only two things that can happen to bring that back up. You or the enemy. Because God never will. God never will. It's, it's, it, it's wiped away. It's gone. And it's blotted out. Nobody prosecutes the faith better than Hasatan. The 
prosecutor. That's what it means. You see, his job is the best in the universe, isn't it? But here's the kicker. We've got the best defense attorney that there is. And it's a really, really loaded court because the best defense attorney's dad is the judge. ironclad defense and it gets you off every time the father always charges your sin to your shoes account but you have to employ him as your defense attorney your sins blotted out obliterated blotted out sounds really benign doesn't it it's obliterated annihilated Smashed to pieces. That's the Hebrew. It's gone forever. Now, there can be ramifications for sin, but the sin's gone. Violently hurled as far as the east is to the west. Lock that in your heart and believe it, because it's true. Absolutely true. You, you've got to walk in that and believe that. If, you're not, if you don't, you, you're not going to have an anointed power to share you, you can't take somebody where you've not been can you you've got to let it go it's what people are looking for they, li they are literally dying in the sins and being destroyed in the guilt they need to know they have a heavenly father who forgives and that when you realize that you're going to fall head over heels in love with him and all you're going to want to do is tell everybody about him. That's amazing grace, isn't it? He cleanses, he purifies with his holy love and his forgiveness is legit. And it's true and it's always and forever. So, nearly home. Look at this, Matthew 21. When Yeshua entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred. Who's this? They asked, and the crowds answered, This is Yeshua. He is the prophet, the prophet from Nazareth. Hebrews says, Therefore, since we have a great Kohen Gadol, a great and high priest, who has passed through the highest heaven, Yeshua, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we acknowledge as true. Matthew 27 says, Yeshua was brought before the governor. And the governor put this question to him. Are you the king of the Jews? And he said, the words are yours. When you see great and high priest, that, that's the only time you're going to see that in the Bible. Right there. The Kohen got all you sure. And now he's, befront, he's in front of Pilate. And Pilate says, are you the king? And he says, the words are yours. Really, he's saying, you bet I am. But he's really acknowledging the statement without confirming or denying. He's being very clever. It reflects wisdom and it reflects restraint under severe duress. He's claiming kingship. It's going to get misused and mis misinterpreted. Interpreted? Interpreted. Put your teeth back in. <laughs> Where did that come from? It's going to get used against him. So leaving Pilate's words to stand, it allows for leaving room for deeper reflection, doesn't it? And understanding. King of the Jews, he certainly is. He is the king of the universe. He is a prophet, he is a priest, and he is our king. But no ordinary prophet, priest, and king. Pilate handed Yeshua over to him and had him, had him put to death on a stake. So they took charge of Yeshua, carrying the stake himself. He went out to a place called Golgotha, Aramaic. There they nailed him to a stake, along with two others, on either side with Yeshua in the middle. Pilate also had a notice written and posted on the stake. And it read, Yeshua from Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Wouldn't have been in English though. It was in Hebrew, 
It was in Greek. I think Aramaic. It's a big sign then. Or maybe it wasn't. He has to be killed at the hands of Torahless men, the Romans, the Jews had no authority to kill him. None. The reality though, well for one we all killed him, didn't we? And don't you think he could have just gone and had 72,000 angels posted all around him and wiped the world out in a blink? That's our God. He is that powerful. But he didn't, did he? He gave his life, that's why. He laid his life down. His crime was written on the stake on the plaque. And it would have said, Yeshua, Hanatzaret Vamilik Hayudim. Yud He Vav He. You hey Vav hey, just look at what God's saying to the universe. He's saying Yeshua is the Messiah. He's the one who's coming in the clouds. Every eye will see him, including those whom he pierced. Who pierced him? I'm sorry. Including those who, who pierced him. All the tribes of the land will mourn. He says, "Yes, Amen. I am." The Alpha and the Omega, the A and the Z, the Aleph and the Tav. It says Adonai, God of heaven's armies, the one who is coming. The one who is, the one who was, and the one who is coming. Yeshua was the prophet testifying to the truth. Yeshua is our great and high priest, and Yeshua is coming back to rule and reign as the King of Kings. And the Lord of Lords. Amen. And amen. amen. Shabbat shalom. Beautiful. Cool. You all want to stand and grab somebody's hand? We're going to uh, have a blessing and have a party because it's Father's Day tomorrow. And we've got, I think we've got sausages and hot chips and all sorts going on. So stick around and enjoy. Amen. Hope you got something out of it. Cool bananas. Not too bad. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may he give you what this world never ever will. His peace. He is the prince of all peace. Amen. Amen. Vihunecha, Yisa Adonai Pono Velecha, Vi Assemblica, Shalom, Shabbat Shalom, Beth Yeshua.